Hello, I'm Jim Salisbury with Mitsutoya America Corporation, and welcome to the Metrology Training Lab. In this episode, we want to discuss the truly amazing gauge block and talk about their use and a little bit about their calibration. I have to admit, I'm a bit awestruck with the gauge block. These simple little blocks are something special. Each one with their flat and parallel surfaces and with an accuracy of just a few millionths of an inch. We've used gauge blocks in previous episodes of the Metrology Training Lab, but in this episode, we get to understand them better and appreciate their role as a premier measurement standard. Gauge blocks come in sets like these, and you can use these sets to build any length you need. And when done properly, those lengths are more accurate than pretty much anything else. What's even more amazing is that gauge blocks were invented over 100 years ago, and they haven't changed much in that time. They have quietly played an important role supporting all the incredible technologies that have been developed since the early 1900s. That's pretty cool. Gauge blocks were invented in Sweden by C.E. Johansson. He didn't invent the idea of length standards, but he patented the idea of a set of blocks that can be used to build various lengths. And he was an incredible machinist, and his company was able to produce gauge blocks to tight tolerances that allowed so many others to achieve new levels of accuracy in manufacturing. Some people will refer to gauge blocks as Joe blocks in reference to Johansson. Johansson was also a pioneer in precision engineering and the standard reference temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees C comes in part because he needed everybody to pick a common temperature. And when the top scientists around the world asked, he recommended 68 degrees Fahrenheit because that worked well for him. We have here an actual set of Johansson blocks that one of my colleagues at Mid Toya America collected. You can see the Johansson name and Sweden marked on the gauge blocks. The sets we sell today don't look much different. Modern gauge block sets basically follow his 100-year-old patent. During World War I, the US government became worried about the supply of gauge blocks to the United States from Sweden. Along came a Mr. W.E. Hoke, who developed his own way to make gauge blocks around 1917. He made them round with a hole in the middle to make them easier for him to lap flat. The square gauge block with the hole in the middle was derived from Hoke's design. And still today, you can buy gauge blocks in either Johansson's rectangular design or in Hoke's square design. Rectangular blocks are much more common, but some people like the square blocks. In other episodes of the Metrology Training Lab, you will see us picking either rectangular or square blocks for various tasks. For the interested viewer, Mitsutoya has published a little book on the history of gauge blocks. You can download that for free from our on-demand educational resources on our website. Modern gauge blocks come rectangular or square in inch or millimeter sizes. The typical set includes lengths up to four inches, but you can get long block sets up to 20 inches. And you can special order gauge blocks up to 40 inches or one meter long. The most common material for gauge blocks is steel, mostly because the price is quite attractive. Other standard materials include carbide and ceramics. One of the big advantages of ceramic gauge blocks is that they don't rust. However, if you take care of steel blocks, such as wearing gloves when you handle them and putting light oil on them when they're stored, they can last years, even decades, depending on how you're using them. For this episode, however, I'm gonna mostly use ceramic blocks. The real reason 
is that these lights here are quite hot and my hands sweat in these gloves. And getting sweat all over steel gauge blocks is not good practice. Now I can tell you some more advantages of ceramic gauge blocks, but I don't want to sound like a salesman. And that's not the purpose of this episode. Gauge blocks are sold by grades. The grades define tolerances for the flatness and parallelism of the faces, as well as the tolerance for the size that's marked on the blocks. The grades apply whether the blocks are ceramic or steel, and whether they're rectangular or square. For example, these three one-inch gauge blocks, if they're all grade zero, according to the tolerances in the standard, it would be plus or minus six millionths of an inch. If this gauge block or all three of these gauge blocks had been properly calibrated and found to be intolerance, then I would know that the length is somewhere between the minus six millionths and the plus six millionths of an inch. I told you these things were accurate. If this was instead, say, a grade AS2 gauge block, the tolerance would go from six millionths of an inch up to 24 millionths of an inch. Gauge block grades are defined in national and international standards. In the US, we use the American National Standard for Gauge Blocks, ASME B89.1.9. You can also find the tolerance table in the Mitsutoya catalog. All manufacturers of gauge blocks sell them in grades in accordance to the standards. You should select gauge blocks based on your accuracy needs. In a calibration lab, grade zero gauge blocks are quite common. So that's a brief introduction to gauge blocks. How do we use them? Gauge block faces are very flat and very smooth. The reason for this is that that allows gauge blocks to ring together. Without using any adhesive, gauge blocks can be brought together and the flat smooth surfaces will adhere to each other without causing any damage. When done properly, the gap between the two gauge blocks is somewhere around one millionth of an inch. And when you're done, they can be broken apart and reused over and over. And any flat or smooth surface will ring together. Steel to steel, ceramic to ceramic, even an optical flat, such as shown here. I've rung together three different gauge blocks, rectangular, steel, ceramic, and optical flat. All four of those blocks are rung together nice and tight. That's pretty neat. The idea behind Johansson's original patent was the particular sizes in a set of gauge blocks. They allow you to build an accurate stack of gauge blocks to create any length you need. So let's walk through the ringing process. When you ring blocks, you apply quite a bit of force. To avoid scratching your blocks, it's important they are clean. It's important, particularly for steel blocks, to also make sure there is no raised edge or burr or some sort of ding. First, I'll use some denatured alcohol to clean the block. And then I'll use this Minotoya Sarah stone to remove any burrs. This is sometimes called conditioning the block. We're not changing the length of the block. We're just removing any high spots, particularly on the edges. I can use a small Sarah stone like this using a push-pull technique, or I can use a large one like this. And some people like to go in a figure eight pattern. And no, you don't have to buy a Mitotoya Sarah stone. 
but they do work well. Some people recommend using a small granite surface plate. And it's hard to say how often you need to condition your blocks. It really depends on how you're using them. If you were to very lightly slide a gauge block across a surface plate, you may feel it catch or hear kind of a scratchy sound that indicates a raised spot. In those cases, you should do the conditioning. I'm also not going to pretend to understand the physics on why ringing works. I'm an engineer. I just need to know that it works and how to do it. In fact, it seems to be a bit debated as to why it really works. We'll leave that for the interested viewer. What is important to know is that ringing works best with a very, very slight amount of light oil or grease on the gauge block faces. We really don't use anything special in our lab for ringing. We have these 20 year old stamp pads lying around that have some WD-40 sprayed on them. Yes, WD-40. I can only imagine the comments that will be posted on our use of WD-40. All you need to do is dab the gauge block in it and then wipe it off on a dry cloth. We don't use any solvent here because we don't want to remove the oil. We want just a little bit left on it. Now I'm gonna ring these two blocks together. And you do have to apply quite a bit of force when you're sliding one block against the other. So I'm gonna set these two up here and I'm gonna try to slide this block against this block as so. This is the kind of the slide technique. Another technique is kind of the, the push and slide technique where you come from a side you go like this and then you rotate the block as you're pushing. I'm not doing it now, I'm just trying to demonstrate how it's done. On the square blocks, uh, you can typically use a, a push and twist technique. Uh, in fact, it looks like I just accidentally rung those two together. All right, so back to these two blocks here. I'm going to push on this while I'm sliding across here, and you can see my thumb turn a little bit white as I do that. And if I did it right, those two blocks are now rung together pretty well. When you're all done using the rung gauge blocks, you can just slide them back apart like this. If you leave the blocks rung together for say several days or more, it can become very hard to take them apart. So don't leave them rung for too long. Ringing requires handling the gauge blocks, which may warm them up a bit. So once they're rung, you can clean the outside surfaces and then let them sit for a little while to cool back to the ambient temperature. How long to sit depends on how much you handle them and what your accuracy needs are. If you want to see how well you can ring, a fun and easy test is to ring two blocks together that add up to the value of a third. Say this 450 and 550 block, which add up to one inch, and we compare it to a one inch block. So we ring these two blocks together, and then using something like a high accuracy detector like this Mu Checker, I can then compare the rung block stack to the single block. Now this test is not super accurate, but it should be good enough to see if your ringing skills are good enough to say calibrate a micrometer. Our last topic on gauge blocks is their calibration. In our calibration lab here at mid -Toy America, we use really cool automated gauge block comparators but we have a manual version here in the metrology training lab. So let's head over there and I'll discuss some important topics on calibration. Gauge blocks are usually calibrated using a comparison method. This is the master block and this is the customer block to be calibrated. We set the comparator using the master block and then measure the customer block. 
In accordance to B89.1.9, the length tolerance for gauge blocks applies across the entire surface of the gauge block, not just at that gauge point. And the standard discusses the importance of checking the size in addition to the gauge point at all four corners. This fixture here moves the gauge block around such that we can measure the four corners quickly and easily. In order to state conformance to grade in accordance to the ASME B89.19 standard, all five of these points must be in tolerance. Gaze block calibration practice in the United States is sometimes a bit sloppy. To save calibration costs, some people have been convinced to go with a single point calibration where the corners are not checked at all. The only time that's acceptable is when you're only using the gauge block at that exact measurement point. And I think that's pretty rare. Please be careful with exposing yourself to calibration risks just to save a few dollars. If you just need a cert to show some auditor, well, that's your business. But if you really care about quality, do the calibration right. I hope you learned a few things about gauge blocks. If you have questions or want to see something else on gauge blocks, please post your comments. Thank you, I'm Jim Salisbury, and I'll see you next time from the Metrology Training Lab.